It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you uh, so very much, Speaker. My first question this morning is to the Premier. Eight months ago, the Premier appointed a new Minister of Education who was supposed to bring a new approach. Eight months later, schools across Ontario have closed and parents are scrambling to deal with the impacts of the government's cuts. The government, the Premier, his minister have poisoned the relationship with teachers, with school boards, with the unions at the bargaining table, and with the province's parents and students. Why is this minister still at his job? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, he's at his job because he's one of the best ministers we've ever seen. That's why he's at his job. Minister Lecce is laser focused on getting a deal. Minister Lecce is laser focused in making sure kids stay in the classroom. And through you, Mr. Speaker, we've been reasonable. We've made significant moves on the table. And priority number one, again, is to make sure the kids get back into the classroom. Mr. Speaker, we listen to the parents of students. We reduce the class size from 28 down to 25. We reduce mandatory Order. online learning from four down to two, and we committed in making sure we kept existing full-day kindergarten. That's why he's the best minister, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I would submit that the laser is broken, and so is the operator of that laser. Fewer cuts doesn't mean that the cuts are off the table, and that's the problem that we have here in this province. Fewer cuts are still cuts, and parents don't want those cuts to affect the quality of their kids' education. Families have scrambled as this Premier has been missing in action. He's refusing to admit that those classroom cuts are causing a crisis in our education system, and he's allowed his Minister of Education to belittle teachers and education workers and ramp up the rhetoric, the same rhetoric that the Premier's using, that's causing the chaos in our classroom speaker. If the Premier has had any progress that he could point to, that, that they've made on this file, he should do so now. And if not, will he admit that it is actually time for a different Question. approach with a new minister? Premier, to reply. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I know the NDP a little tough on math, but I'll, I'll just give the, the sheer numbers. When they say about cuts, they consider $1.2 billion more, more than any government in the history of Ontario. We're investing again $1.2 billion more into education in this province. We're investing $3.1 billion in special education funding, the highest levels Order. of this province has ever, ever seen. Wow. We've announced a four-year math strategy, Order. putting $200 million into math. Until we aren't the lowest level of math, we become the highest level yeah, yeah, yeah. when it comes to uh, gauging who has the best kids in the country. We will have the best kids in the country when it comes to math. Response? We're taking the cell phones out of the classrooms, Mr. Speaker. We're making financial literacy a key part of our new math curriculum until kids can balance the, the finances. Thank you very much. Thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's pretty sad when you have a Premier that doesn't understand the impact of inflation on budgets that are fixed in our various institutions like our schools. But look, students and their parents will tell you every time that this Premier says that his approach is working, things actually get worse in our schools. They don't need an education minister or a Premier, for that matter, spinning tales about bargaining sessions that the minister has never even attended. They don't need dark money ads anonymously attacking teachers in our schools, and they don't need a government that fires 10,000 teachers. Will the Premier do the right thing today, Speaker, give a new Minister of Education a new mandate to bargain an actual deal that does not include cuts to the classrooms? So please take their seats. Members, so please take your seats. The government to reply. I recognize the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're creating a new math curriculum for grades one to eight, Mr. Speaker, which will be ready for the next school year, and it's well, well overdue. We're 
We are more than doubling, Mr. Speaker, mental health funding in schools and investing 180 <laughs> mental health support staff. We're providing more than $2 billion for child care early year program in 2019 to 2020 and creating are you ready for this one, Mr. Speaker? 30,000 new child care spaces in schools. We said, we said, Mr. Speaker, no teacher would lose their job because of the changes in the class size online learning. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? We're doing exactly that. We're investing $1.6 billion Spons. to ensure that no teacher loses their job. Promise made, Order. promise kept. Thank you. The House will come to order. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier, uh, but I, I have to say nobody believes what he says because that evidence is not there. Exactly. Teachers are losing their jobs, Speaker. Two years ago, the Premier made another promise, and it was a promise to parents with children with autism. That's right. Here's what he said, and I'm going to quote. We will be there to support you 1,000 per cent. I promise you, you won't have to be protesting on the front of Queen's Park like you have with the Liberal Premier. Today, once again, those parents are here, and they are absolutely protesting on the lawns of Queen's Park. Why did the Premier break this promise to these children and their families? Government to reply. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to remind the member opposite that uh, no government has gotten this file right in 30 years, and that's why we took that's why we took the unprecedented uh, step over the summer of last year, Mr. Speaker, to head out on a province-wide tour and meet with parents face to face and understand uh, the issues around the autism file and what wasn't working for them. At the same time, uh, we convened an expert panel, Mr. Speaker, that met 18 times, all day sessions throughout the summer, Mr. Speaker, uh, to ensure that the autism community was developing a plan for the autism community, one that would work, one that would be sustainable, Mr. Speaker, one that would be needs-based, one that was properly funded, Mr. Speaker. That's why this Order. Premier infused an additional $300 million, Response. bringing this to a $600 million program in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're bent and we're bound to get this right, Mr. Speaker. That's what we'll do for this community. Thank you very much. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, things have gone from bad to worse in this province for children with autism, and it is heartbreaking to see what those kids are going through, regressing in terms of their progress, and what their parents have to be put through in terms of having the anxiety of knowing that they're not getting the services that their kids deserve. For two years, for two years, families heard empty promises from this Ford government, but the wait list has gotten worse. It has barely moved. And the minister who was hired to fix this mess broke his promise. He promised that services would be in place by April of this year, and they are nowhere to be seen. How long are families going to have to wait, Speaker? Minister to reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that uh, what I promised is that no child that was in an ABA behavioral therapy program would have their uh, program end. They have had continuity, Mr. Speaker. Any child that was in an ABA program has seen a seamless transition. They've had their programs extended, Order. Mr. Speaker. Order. At the same time, thousands and thousands of children across the province weren't receiving any kind of service from their provincial government. And that's why we're extending the childhood budgets, and that's why we're also offering one-time funding for all families out there, Mr. Speaker, who have never received any help Order. from any provincial government over the years, Mr. Speaker. All families will be, will be receiving some help as we're developing a new needs-based program in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, one that's going to work for all of these families Response. in the future, and it will be properly funded, Mr. Speaker. We've added 300 million dollars to the Ontario Autism Program, twice the funding of the previous Liberal government. Mr. Thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, not only are there parents right now in this chamber weeping, but parents have been weeping for years and years as this callous government has transitioned their kids to nothing, to zero programs, and to fewer therapists. 
consistent access to services in communities from one end of this province to the other. No parent should have to sit in frustration. Nobody should sit in this chamber in tears as they watch their child waiting for the services that they so desperately need and deserve. No parent should be forced to protest on the lawns of Queen's Park to get their government to listen to what they have to say and to get the help that their kids need. Yet that's exactly what these mums and dads have been forced to do. First by the Liberal government and now by the Ford government. How long are they going to have to keep waiting, Speaker? And if the answer is for some transition that's never going to appear, then shame on Question. Mr. Ford, shame on him for breaking his promise, shame on this government. I'm going to ask the members to take their seats. Minister to reply. Mr. Speaker, um, that's why we're taking the time to get this right. Because no government has ever taken Ask the member to take a seat. The official opposition must come to order. I have to be able to hear the minister who's responding to the question. Minister, please conclude your response. Speaker, uh, what we are going to be providing in the new Ontario Autism Program is exactly what the autism community has asked for. Needs-based therapy, ABA therapy, as well as speech-language pathology, occupational therapy, and for the first time ever, Mr. Speaker, mental health services will be offered in the new OAP. And we will have early intervention as well. What I heard as I traveled the province, Mr. Order. Speaker, is that families, when they received their diagnosis, were lost. They Spons. didn't know where to turn. That's why we're providing family foundational services upon diagnosis, Mr. Speaker. There is going to be an urgent crisis response as well that's available for families. This is going to be an Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Welcome back, Mr. Speaker, and my question is for the Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, from daily press conferences full of misinformation to gala speaking engagements at the Canadian Club, it seems like the Minister has been everywhere during the break, everywhere but the bargaining table, where talks with education unions— Ask the, uh, minister, the member to withdraw her own parliamentary comment and then to place her question. Um, withdrawn. Worse still, the government has done everything in their power to prevent a deal, refusing to back down on cuts, class size hikes, and this absurd Alabama-style risky e-learning scheme. Speaker, it's clear that this minister, like the last minister, has failed Ontarians. Will he finally admit that these cuts are causing irreparable damage to our public education system and step aside? question is addressed to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, speaker, over the past days, I've spoken to parents, and they've been clear that the union escalation is taking a toll on them, on the parents of a special needs son who told me that they need consistency in their son's day, of uh, the single parents who said that they've used all of their vacation days to deal with these strikes, of low-income families who struggle to afford childcare, on everyday people who work harder and take home less. It is for them. It is for their children that we have a duty to redouble our efforts to get a deal, and our commitment is to keep them in a safe learning environment. Our commitment is to ensure that they're in class, and that's why I'm urging the unions to work with the government and the trustees in good faith to get a deal and ensure our children remain in class. I'm going to ask the member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek, to withdraw his unparliamentary comment. I, get, I withdraw. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister, and I can just say that all of that, all of that that the minister just said, all of that is on you, Minister. It is on the Minister of Education, creating a, sla a safe learning environment for students with special needs. Try not increasing class sizes. Try not eliminating the staff that support those students. They say Ontarians are on side with their plan. Let me tell you, Ontarians don't agree. They do not believe you. They are offside with parents and students. Their own consultation results said so, and then they tried to bury the results. They're offside with educators, which isn't a surprise when you try to fire 10,000 of them. And they're offside with students whose lives have been thrown into chaos because of this government's cuts. Right Mr. Speaker, when is this government going to face facts that the only Question. group on side with their plan is an anonymous front group set up by their wealthy friends? <laughs> Of education respond. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, under this government, we are spending more, 
but we also expect more for the students of this province. And that's why in this negotiation, we're fighting for a good deal, a good deal for students, a deal that invests more and expects more, a deal that ensures that merit is the guiding principle of hiring, not union seniority, a deal that protects in writing speaker, full-day kindergarten, a model that is working in our province, maintaining the smallest classroom sizes in Canada for the earliest years, a deal that invests in student success, in math supports, in mental health, in special education, a good deal that keeps kids in class. That's what we're fighting for in this negotiation, and I urge the union, in good faith, to redouble their efforts, work with us, get a deal, keep kids in class. Thank you. The next question, the member for Markham, Unionville. Mr. Speaker, happy 2020. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, since our government's election, we have been focused on helping to economically turn this province around. For far too long, small business leaders throughout this province have to endure economic and regulatory hardship that limit job potential and growth. That is why our government acts to implement policies to help make our province more competitive. This includes our red tape in legislation, the Better for People, Smarter for Business Act, which will help companies save up to $338 million per year in compliance costs. Or the tax relief we are providing to help businesses by cutting the small business tax rate from 3.5% to 3.2%. Premier, can you share with the legislature Question. about Ontario's economic and job creation standing 2019? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question is to the Premier. Well, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank our All Star member from Markham Union, Unionville. He ends up with like 67% of the vote. The guy's a champion up there. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our government is making Ontario better. We're making Ontario better, Mr. Speaker, with the 307,000 jobs. As the previous government, the NDP and the Liberals, lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs, again, per capita, we're leading North America in economic job growth right here in Ontario. 307,000 more families are working, 307,000 more families are putting food on the table, paying rent, paying a mortgage. And we did that, Mr. Speaker, by making sure we reduce the burdens on the backs of businesses, reducing taxes for small businesses 8.75%. Reducing the burden of red tape Response. by $338 million, Mr. Speaker. Cutting, cutting the, the workman's comp by 47 per cent. That's $2.2 billion. Thank you very much. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, back to the Premier. Premier, this is truly incredible news. I know in my writing the results are starting to show with people beginning once again feel more confident in Ontario's economic future. It goes to show that you have long championed regarding the pivotal role that Ontario plays as the economic cornerstone for the strength of our country. And with over 300,000 jobs created since we formed government, Premier, you are correct in what the world is now saying about the economic miracle happening in our province. Premier, can you share with the House more information about the economic success that is happening in Ontario and what this means going forward? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Premier. I thank a, a great member from Markham Unionville. Mr. Speaker, myself and the champion right beside me, Minister of Economic Development, went down to the U.S. and we went down to Washington, spoke to the 50 governors, which were inviting for the first time in Toronto, the NGA, April 21st to April 23rd. Then we went down to Texas, Mr. Speaker, and we spoke to the Texas Chamber of Commerce. A gentleman we didn't even know stood up and said, the Ontario miracle. It's a miracle how the previous government was down here and lost 300,000 jobs, and you are leading North America in job creation at 307,000 new jobs. They were asking how we did it. We create the environment for companies to thrive and prosper and grow, and the people of Ontario have never seen this in decades, Mr. Speaker. 76 percent of Response. every single job created here in Canada was created created right here in Ontario. Again, promises made, promises kept. There's an economic... Thank you. Stop the clock.
Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, nice to see you in the chair. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, two weeks ago, a shadowy group calling themselves the Vaughan Working Families spent untold thousands to run attack ads against teachers in four national newspapers. This group has been connected to a Mr. Quinto Anabale, a longtime Conservative donor and activist who this government appointed to the board of the LCBO. The government claims it has no knowledge of the ads and no connections to this group, but the ads mirror perfectly the government's attacks on teachers and education workers. Speaker, will the Premier confirm today in this House, on the permanent record, that he, his Minister of Education, any other ministers or members of the PC caucus, and any of the Premier's ministers or minister staff knew nothing about these ads? Government to reply. Government House Leader. Yes. Supplementary question. I, speaker, I, I, pardon me, I didn't hear the minister's answer. I don't know. Does he want to reiterate for the House? You said yes. You he answered. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, we, that's what we suspect, Speaker. We suspected that the government knew about these ads. In fact, we suspect that the government coordinated with these ads. Speaker, the so-called Working Families Group tried to hide their identity, Speaker, but the ads have been linked to some of the most well-connected Conservative insiders that you can find. Mr. Anabali travelled with the Minister of Economic Development to India in December. Mr. Anabali has personally donated over $30,000 to the PC party. Wow. The Premier himself personally appointed Mr. Anabali to the LCBO. Yet today, when we tried to bring him before the Government Agencies Committee, the Conservatives members question. Blocked. Speaker, why is this Premier and his government so afraid? And what are they afraid of hearing from Mr. Anabali? Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll reiterate, uh, not only do they have trouble with math, but apparently understanding their order. questions. Order. Member for Essex, come to order. Stop yelling across the house. Order. <laughs> if the house would come to order, we could all hear the person who has the floor. I know. Government House Leader, reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'll uh, continue on, uh, Mr. Speaker. As, uh, as I mentioned in my first answer, of course, the, uh, I can confirm that the government did not have any knowledge of this ad. I can tell you that it wasn't particularly helpful or useful because the Minister of Education has been working so hard to get a deal that respects uh, parents and teachers, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but uh, on, this, uh, on this, let me be guided by the member for Toronto, Danforth. Who, when asked about this very same thing, said that he did not believe that a law had been broken, and nor did he believe that the member in question uh, uh, should be removed from his appointment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Out front today, there will be parents of children with autism and those people who support them protesting the mess your government has made of the Ontario Autism oh. Program. Order. Speaker. This Friday, the government side come to order. time in 20 years, every school in this province will be closed and kids will be out of school yet again. Speaker, the Premier and his government are making a mess of education too. Increasing government sizes, side come to order. less support for vulnerable learners, and a poorly thought out plan for online learning. Stop the clock. Government side has to come to order. I apologize to the member for Ottawa South for interrupting. Start the clock. Member for Ottawa South. I know it's hard to hear, but our classrooms need to be strong, safe places for our kids to learn. So, Speaker, through you, can the Premier explain to all of us here in the galleries all over why he thinks making class sizes larger is a good thing for Ontario's kids and their families? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 
schools. Minister of Education to reply. Uh, thank you very much, schools. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Speaker, what the Premier has indicated is that we expect more, notwithstanding that the government is investing more in public education. Speaker, we expect more for our kids. Between 2003 and 2004, we have seen more than 50 per cent increase in investment in public education, but we haven't seen the corresponding improvements of the system. During that period, we have 12 per cent more teachers in the schools, less than 1 per cent more students. Speaker, we spent over 80 cents of the dollar on compensation, yet hiring is still tied to uh, is still tied rather to seniority instead of qualification and equity considerations. Speaker, we need a system that truly works for the students of this province, a system that is ready for the disruption on the landscape, that, is in that ensures our kids are technolog technologically savvy, financially literate, are emotionally intelligent and job ready for the jobs of tomorrow. Speaker, that's Fine. our mission. We're focused on a deal that keeps kids in class. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I would remind the minister they're spending less per pupil this year than they were uh, last year. So just remind the, the, the minister. And perhaps the minister could explain why private schools constantly market smaller class sizes to encourage people to come. Perhaps he can explain that to all of us. Speaker, the government has been all over the map in education. Larger class sizes, a poorly thought out plan for online learning, firing their negotiating team 180 days in, then talking about protecting full-day kindergarten as if it was ever at risk because they know Ontario families would revolt. Speaker, question. now they're calling for a private mediator. Clearly, the government has no plan, and they're making a mess, just like they did with the Ontario Autism Program, just like they did with climate change, and question. just like they've done with their new license plates. So, Speaker, sir, you. Is the minister really interested Order. in negotiating a deal or not? Thank you. Exactly. Minister of Education. Speaker, the government is committed to doing everything possible to get a deal that keeps children in class. This has gone on for too long, Speaker, and I think the parents of this province recognize that, given that this takes place every few years in this province. Speaker, in this negotiation, we are fighting hard at the table with a mission to get a deal, but a good deal for our students. A deal that, yes, invests more but expects more from the system. A deal that ensures that merit triumphs over union seniority. A deal that protects in writing full-day kindergarten. A deal that codifies that through the negotiator. And, Mr. Speaker, a deal that ensures we retain the smallest classroom sizes in the nation for the earliest years. Speaker, our goal is a deal but a good deal for the kids of this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nice to see you again. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. Last week, I listened as the minister delivered a speech at the Economic Club of Canada in continuing her tireless efforts to move our government's subway expansion plan forward. She covered a lot of territory, from the region's congested crisis to the province's landmark partnership with the City of Toronto. Thank you for that. She also gave us a sneak peek at the tools she plans to introduce that will allow us to get shovels in the ground on time, on budget, for our priority subway projects. Could the minister please tell us what tools those tools look like? Thank you. The Minister of Transportation, please Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for the question. Our government has been clear, Mr. Speaker, that we are committed to doing things differently. We've identified the roadblocks that have Order. prevented big projects from, from being built for ages, for decades. I've said in the past that our plan is ambitious, but it is attainable. The legislative tools I outlined earlier this month, Mr. Speaker, if passed, will allow us to speed up the delivery of our projects to ensure that they get built on time and on budget. Improving Order. coordination and on-time delivery are key objectives of our plan. Our plan, if passed, would give Metrolinx the authority to require stronger coordination of utility relocations within prescribed time frames. And we are also looking at modernizing Fonts. the province's authority to assemble lands while still treating landowners fairly. Mr. Speaker, these are the tools that we need to get transit back on track. I look forward to sharing more in the second. Thank you very much. Order. The supplementary question. Thank you to the minister for the answer, and I just want to say the people of Etobicoke Lakeshore are very appreciative that we are moving forward. And it is clear that it is time that we get transit sure. built. Our four priority Hamilton projects East, Stony will Creek, connect come to more people to more places and bring public transit to communities with poor access, like Thorncliffe Park and Flemington Park. 
We campaigned on investing in our transit infrastructure, and that is exactly what this government is doing. Could the minister tell us more about her proposed plan to accelerate the delivery of our four priority subway projects? Great Minister, Mr. Speaker, thank you again to the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, we have identified the processes that have delayed timelines and have pushed big projects like this off the rails. Improving coordination and streamlining the processes where we can are crucial to meeting our target dates. Our plan proposes changes to the environmental assessment process, which will give us the flexibility to align our timelines with these projects. To be clear, Mr. Speaker, these changes do not change the outcomes of the EA process, only the timelines. I look forward to introducing our comprehensive plan in the near future. Our government has a plan to build public transit better and faster, and we're doing so while protecting taxpayers' best interests. In partnership and collaboration with our partners, Mr. Speaker, we're moving forward on our transit plans Response. because there is an undertaking. This is an undertaking that we can no longer afford to delay. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today, yet again, hundreds of families of children with autism are on the lawn to let you know that you are failing them. One of the families who are with us here today is Talitha. Her daughter, Amira, waited for three years for therapy that she needs. She was next on the wait list before your government froze and gutted the OAP. After years of waiting, Talitha's hope was crushed. Amira finally received a childhood budget, but it lasted for only a few months. She now has to wait even longer with fear of regression. Given all the delays, cuts, and misinformation, how can families like Talitha trust that they will ever get the help they need? Question. Why does this government insist on making families' lives harder? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services to reply. Mr. Speaker, what we're actually doing is providing that certainty for families, and we've been transparent all the way along, Mr. Speaker. That's why we had the expert panel meet over the summer last year and come up with over 120 recommendations from the autism community for the autism community, and we are implementing those recommendations now, Mr. Speaker. So that families like Talitha's will have the assurances that they need that a needs-based program will be there well into the future. One that's adequately funded, not like the one that the previous government had. It was a Band-Aid, Mr. Speaker, to get them through the election period. This program is one that is going to be funded to the tune of $600 million each and every year. One that's a needs-based program while offering other services as well, like speech-language pathology, occupational therapy, mental health, early intervention, crisis response, all too much to mention in one little spot, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to the question. Order. The supplementary question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Adults with developmental disabilities are suffering under this Conservative government, too. The Liberals severely underfunded supportive housing. They failed vulnerable families, and the Conservatives have sat on their hands. Now there's over 16,000 people on the wait list, over 20 years long. Families are being told by this government that their options are hospitals and homeless shelters. Whoa. There are parents here today living the nightmare. April's daughter, Courtney, has autism and is nonverbal. Courtney has been in a short-term psychiatric unit for nearly 16 months. Bonnie's daughter, Jennifer, has Williams syndrome and has been bounced between shelters for over two years. Maureen's son, Stephen, has autism and high needs. He has been in a psychiatric unit over 17 months. Tammy said Damien spent over 15 months in a hospital psych unit waiting for a behavioral treatment bed. This is heart-wrenching and totally unacceptable. Will the Premier stop the platitudes and finally get to work salt? Thank you. Minister to respond. 
Thanks uh, very much uh, for the question uh, from the member opposite. And as the member knows, there is a growing demand for developmental services in Ontario, and there has been uh, for many, many years, Mr. Speaker. The previous government was in power for 15 years and chose not to make any investments in this sector during that time. We're not going to be doing that, Mr. Speaker. Order. That's why Opposition we have order. taken the steps to talk with Stop. other jurisdictions, Stop. leading jurisdictions in this area, Mr. Speaker. Opposition, to come to order. We're starting to meet the demand that exists with these individuals. We know that the list is growing, Mr. Speaker, because of the inaction of the previous 15 years. That's why Member for Windsor West, come to order. Investing in this area, Mr. Speaker, we're currently having consultations with Mr. our Scarborough partners Gildwood, in this come sector, to order. and as I mentioned, consulting with leading jurisdictions to find out Response. what's going to work, Mr. Speaker. Those individuals that are in the most need are assessed on the priority they get their housing first mr speaker uh, we are going to thank you thank you the house come to order the member for glengarry prescott russell merci monsieur thank you mr speaker speaker my question is to the minister of education Last Thursday, thousands of uh, Francophone teachers were on strike for the first time since the creation of the 12 Francophone school boards in 1998. 1998, Mr. Speaker, that's a very serious situation. I met with them myself in my constituency, and I can tell you that they are there for the students and to defend our education system. We know now that with this government, it is constantly a hang on to your socks. And I can tell you that last week, we uh, hung on to our hats, our ski masks, and our leggings to um, protest the, cost, the cuts made by this government. And we were outside despite the minus 49 degrees in several regions. Will the minister finally do the right thing and cancel these irresponsible cuts so that we can have an agreement and make sure that we have a good education system in Ontario. Thank you. Zidane, thank you, Speaker. We want a good deal for students to keep them in class. In this negotiation, I can affirm to the member opposite what we're fighting for and what we're hoping to achieve through a voluntary settlement. It is to invest more in education, but to expect more for our kids. It is to ensure that hiring is premised and predicated on the experience, the diversity, and the qualification of the candidate, not exclusively on union seniority. In this negotiation, we're committed in writing to protecting full-day kindergarten, a model that works in Ontario. We're committed to improving the outcomes of our students. Mr. Speaker, nous allons continuer notre travail. We will keep working with our partners. We will work hard to improve it in every region of Ontario. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Minister. Our concerns, the teachers' concerns, just like for uh, students and uh, parents, it is compulsory e-learning, class sizes, and cuts for special needs students' support. These are concerns that are very reasonable, Mr. Speaker. These, cu these cuts have a very neg negative effect especially for Francophone students in Ontario. For example, when we're talking about uh, compulsory e-learning, which uh, takes students out of their Francophone environment. Mr. Speaker, did the government consider these consequences before putting in place these measures? And if so, why is the government going forward? Will the government keep taking an ax and cutting everywhere, everywhere and creating irreparable damages? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In fact, spending more, investing more in public education. In fact, under the leadership of this Premier, the highest public expenditure in French language education is happening today under progressive Conservative government because we believe in linguistic duality and in the identity and the preservation of French language in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we are investing more. We are trying to combat the challenge of uh, access to French language educators. We are committed to ensuring every student has access to a strong performance based education. System. But, Mr. Speaker, we also expect more from the system. While investments have risen by 50 per cent, we also need to see corresponding improvements in student performance. That is a reasonable expectation parents deserve. And, Mr. Speaker, the greatest casualty of this debate are the kids, in fact, the students themselves who should be in class. That's why I'm asking the unions Response. in good faith to work with this government to get a deal and keep kids in class. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Malton. Morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. 
members of my community and members of Peel Caucus, this side and that side, appreciate the hard work of the Peel Region Police in keeping people safe. But, Mr. Speaker, we know that more needs to be done to tackle the gun and gang violence that is plaguing our community. I was so pleased to see Premier Ford, Solicitor General Jones, and A.G. Downey and the Peel Caucus announce a vital investment of $20.5 million to support Peel Regional Police in the fight against gun and gang violence. On behalf of our community, on behalf of our caucus, I want to thank the H Solicitor General for the leadership in helping keep people region safe by supporting our frontline officers. Speaker, through you, can the Solic Solicitor General tell this House and my community Question. how our investment will support Peel Region Police in fighting against local crime? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Solicitor General. And thank you to the member from uh, Mississauga Malton. You know, every day our government is working to ensure the safety of our communities and the safety of our streets, which is why I was so pleased earlier uh, this year to stand with the Peel Caucus and my uh, colleague, the Attorney General, to talk about another an investment that we've made in the region of Peel $20.5 million. You know, it is um, clearly understood by our government that this is not a, an issue that is going to be solved exclusively with one ministry. That's why I'm so pleased that we work together jointly with many uh, cross-ministerial issues. But the support will help tackle gun and gang violence as part of Ontario's gun, gang and violence reduction strategy. And it builds on our intensive firearm bail team in Peel Region that Response. the Attorney General um, already announced, which focuses on prosecuting those involved in firearms offences. I am pleased with the leadership of Chief Duriapi, and I'm pleased with the leadership of the Peel MP. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Solicitor General, for your answer. It is clear that our government understands the urgent need that for the action in Peel Region, and that is why you are responding to that call. We know that the criminals do not respect the municipal borders. As MPP from Mississauga Malton, where the shooting happened over the weekend in September 2019, left a bystander team dead and the constant problem at Acon Place. We know that crimin criminals do not respect municipal borders. That's why it is important for the coordinated province-wide strategy to keep our communities safe and not just the urban centers. Speaker. Can the Solicitor General explain how our investment in the Peel Police fits into the government's province-wide strategy to combat gang, gangs and guns, violence, and keep our law-abiding, hard-working communities safe here in Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Solicitor General. Thank you. As the member opposite uh, rightly said, crimes Gangs do not respect municipal boundaries. It's why, since taking office, our government has invested over $160 million in the fight against gun and gang violence and gang activity across Ontario, including our most recent investment in the Peel region. Addressing the crisis of gun and gang violence requires a multi-sectorial response. Our gun and gang violence reduction strategy works to combine prevention, intervention and enforcement through targeted investments from another, um, many partner uh, ministries including Solicitor General, Attorney General, Children, Community and Social Services, and, of course, the Minister of Education. Our investments in Peel Region are also part of our government's new $195 million Community Safety and Policing Grant Program, which Response. supports policing partners across Ontario, addressing the local community safety priorities as identified by each local service. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, and my question is to the Premier. After a lot of money and a lot of fanfare from this government, we have been hearing from the community that the new license plates that rolled out on February 1st are next to impossible to read in the dark. As critic for Transportation and Highways, I received an email from an Ontarian who wrote, quote, it seems that the latest mistake by this Conservative government is yet another example of your policy of ready, fire, aim. Your priorities are not for the people. The same can be said for your gas pump stickers, which don't stick and are needless, unwanted propaganda. This is an important issue for public protection and safety. Recall, remake, resign." End quote. Does the Premier have the sense to recognize that this is something that needs to be fixed, and what is the plan to fix the plates? 
government to reply. I recognize the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to ensure the member opposite and Ontarians listening today and across this province that we are aware that some, some Ontarians are reporting concerns with regards to readability to the naked eye under some light conditions. And that said, we take this input very seriously and we're working with our manufacturers to get down to the bottom of it. But, Speaker, I have to share with you sticking with the status quo liberal plate that was peeling and flaking Order. was not an option. And I'm very pleased to share with you that we're employing new technologies in Ontario plates that have been tested under a whole host of visibility uh, conditions with successful reading results. And so, Speaker, I want to assure the member opposite, we take the input very seriously, Response. we're drilling down on it and getting to the bottom of it. Thank you very much. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I'm glad to know there's new technology, but my eyes are pretty standard, and I should be able to read them as a driver on the roads. <laughs> Speaker, this Premier found buckets of money to brand Ontario license plates with PC Party Blue, and now there are serious concerns about whether those plates even work. They are weirdly reflective, and when lights shine on them, the whole plate glows, and letters and numbers cannot be read with the naked human eye. This is not helpful, nor is it safe. So last week, QP briefing got the scoop that this government planned to throw away thousands of perfectly good and readable white license plates. So why is the government scrapping perfectly good white plates when their glowing propaganda plates are problematic? Order. And I thought Ontario was a place to grow, not a place to glow. But again, <laughs> I would like to know what this Premier plans to do to fix these plates and keep us safe. Members, please take their seats. Outstanding ovation for that. Minister to reply. Thank you very much. Again, Mr. Speaker, I have to remind the member opposite that sticking with the status quo Liberal plates that were Opposition come to order. Making, were absolutely not an option. I am pleased to share with you that the plates that have been introduced to this province, they're working. You know, they're working on the 407. Order. They're being read. They've been tested Opposition under come to order. a whole host of visibility conditions, and we absolutely have confidence in our plates and I know it's difficult for the members opposite to adjust to change but let me tell you I apologize to, I have to interrupt the member I'm going to ask the opposition to come to order the clock is ticking order the minister to reply these, these plates have been tested, and I want to share with you as well, Mr. Speaker, that we're employing technology in the plates that are already being used in other provinces like Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, Response. Quebec, and 13 other states. Speaker, these plates are working. People like them, but I have to make sure that everyone understands we've heard conditions. Thank you very much. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Minister, for years, roads, bridges, and other vital infrastructure projects were neglected due to systemic underfunding. Every day, constituents, local elected officials, and upper and lower tier in my riding ask me what our government's plans are to help support our local infrastructure priorities. Minister, I know we've committed investing $144 billion to things like transit, roads, hospitals right across the province. These investments will have a significant positive impact on the economic development in Northumberland Peterborough South and improve my riding's ability to attract investment and create jobs. Can the minister tell this House, and most importantly constituents in Northumberland Peterborough South, what infrastructure investments our government is making and how they will help the people of my riding? Thank you. Questions addressed to the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. 
Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, for his important question and the great work he does. As I've indicated to the House a number of times, Ontario has nominated more than 350 projects to the federal government under the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Project, or ICIP, for final funding <laughs> approval. This includes 144 road, bridge, air, and marine infrastructure projects, and over 200 public transit projects for a total provincial investment of more than $480 million through the public transit and rural and northern streams of the ICIP agreement. Mr. Speaker, unlike the previous Liberal government, we're making historic investment in infrastructure while working to maximize the federal funding available to Ontario so we can build and improve the Response. infrastructure structure projects that are important to all of us mr speaker i look forward to the supplementary thank you the supplementary question thank you mr speaker minister in march you opened the intake for rural and northern and public transit i worked with our lower and upper tier to make sure we got applications in in may when the intake closed we got a number of vital infrastructure projects submitted to the province. Just two months later, Mr. Speaker, two months later in July, I was there to announce four vital projects in my riding: replacement to a bus fleet in Coburg, improving environmental sustainability and bringing in a new fleet, reconstruction of Centerline Road in Asheville, Norwood, reconstruction of Potash Street in Hiawatha First Nation, and specialized transit and accessibility investments into Port Hope. Mr. Speaker, seven months later. We have yet to receive a dollar from the federal government. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the minister. Minister, what are you doing to ensure that these long-awaited projects in my riding receive the vital funding that they deserve? Thank you. Minister reply. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member. I understand that after almost a year of waiting, uh, the member and his constituents are puzzled as to why less than a third of the more than 350 nominated projects have, rece have, not re have received federal approval. However, I remain optimistic that the federal minister's letter of approval is in the mail and will soon arrive in my office. The minute I receive the formal written approval, I will personally ensure that the member and his constituents and municipal partners know that they can move forward and put shovels in the ground to get these projects built. Mr. Speaker, we have made infrastructure a marquee part of our mandate, and on this side of the House, we understand that investments like these will get people moving, grow the economy, and serve the needs of people Response. and businesses across our great province. Mr. Speaker, again, I'm optimistic the federal federal government will move quickly on these approvals. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. My question is to the Premier. Ontarians who seek help for mental health or addiction issues are faced with long and growing wait lists for services. For years, the Liberals chronically underfunded mental health and addiction programs and neglected the growing demand for these services. This Conservative government has paid a lot of lip service to increasing mental health and addictions funding, but after a year and a half into their mandate, have not put forward an extra penny of provincial funding to improve supports. With the end of the fiscal year quickly approaching, this government does not have much time to match the $174 million in federal funding. Will this government match this funding? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions to reply on behalf of the government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government is delivering real action by investing an historic $3.8 billion over the next 10 years to build a comprehensive, integrated and connected mental health and addiction system. We're committed to building this system where services are easier to access because we know that there have been issues with access, of high quality because we know that there hasn't been a standard of quality and care, and focused on better outcomes for everyone, including children, youth and families. While you claim that, in, that money has not been invested, Mr. Speaker, we have, in fact, made an additional $10 million annually in child and youth mental health core services funding in communities across the province. We've invested money in the education system, $27 million, Response. $6 million in intensive services for youth and addictions, including withdrawal management services. Mr. Speaker, we are making investments and we will continue to make investments to build a system that works. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Back to the Premier. 
Overdose and opioid-related deaths in Ontario doubled in the last three years. We're into the second year of this Conservative government's mandate, and what has the Premier done? Conducted an unnecessary review of overdose prevention sites, rebranded the service, and arbitrarily limited the number of sites. Already 21 sites aren't enough, but only 16 have been approved so far. In British Columbia, overdose rates plateaued when the government took concrete action. When will this government take this public health crisis seriously by listening to the evidence and funding a site in every community that needs one? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government does take the opioid crisis seriously and, in fact, as you've mentioned, has organized and set up 16 consumption and treatment sites in communities in needs across Ontario. CTS sites not only save lives by preventing overdose-related deaths, but also connect people to primary care, treatment and rehabilitation, as well as other health and social services to help them overcome their addiction. And this should be the primary reason for the consumption and treatment sites. Overall availability and access, as measured by the number of consumption booths and hours of operation, have in fact increased under these 16 sites when compared to the same sites under previous models. And Mr. Speaker, our government has allocated $31.3 million dollars in funding for up to 21 consumption and treatment sites. We are waiting applications and reviewing them on an as-need basis. Thank you. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, it is no secret to commuters across the GTA that lengthy, drawn-out and delayed construction timelines are one of the key barriers to reducing gridlock and getting people back onto public transit. People are sick of delays, whether it's political decisions that are holding up the process or construction delays that seem to drag on endlessly. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House what the government plans to do in order to speed up building transit and reduce the gridlock that plagues Toronto's streets and infuriates the commuters of this city? Thank you. I recognize the Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it's also very nice to see you again. I know all of us are excited about kicking off the new year and continuing the good work that we started in terms of making life better for the people of Ontario. One of the challenges that we have had historically when it comes to transit is that different levels of government were on different pages regarding transit planning, and there was a lack of leadership at the provincial level. While, Mr. Speaker, we've solved that problem last fall when the city and the province entered into a historic partnership to build the single largest subway expansion program in the province's history. Now our focus is on introducing new measures to speed up the construction timelines for these major projects. Mr. Speaker, with, the, with Premier Ford's leadership, the era of delays is over. The supplementary question. Thank you to you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Minister. It's always good to hear that the province and the city are working together to enhance transit and get shovels in the ground. The steps we've taken will provide more transit relief to commuters across the region. However, I think I speak for many when I say that the current nightmare that occurs in local communities like my own going through rapid transit construction is far from painless. Through you, Speaker, to the Honourable Minister, what is the government planning to do to expedite building transit and end construction nightmares that plague commuters and businesses with what sometimes seems like no end in sight? Thank you. Minister reply. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for her advocacy on this file. Over the last number of months, the province and the city have been working together to develop a framework to build transit quickly. On February 6th, at the Economic Club, our very own Minister of Transportation outlined some of the steps we are planning on taking when it comes to speeding up building public transit on our four key subway lines. That involves speeding up approvals and timelines for things like re utility relocations, environmental assessments, and permitting. And to be clear, Mr. Speaker, we're not going to be compromising public safety or environmental oversight. We want to speed up and solidify timelines that have historically delayed major infrastructure projects. The time to build is now, Mr. Speaker, and with our government, it's really happening. 
The next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul's. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, last week, we learned from the Globe and Mail that thanks to this government's heartless cuts, rape crisis centres across the province are struggling to provide basic services to survivors. Speaker, for years, the Liberals failed to provide enough funding to meet the needs of survivors. And now this Conservative government is making things worse with continuing over $20 million in cuts to frontline services for next year. Speaker, rape and sexual assault crisis centres, they're not asking for much. Less than 1% to be exact of what Conservatives are spending to tear down windmills. To the Premier, why does this government care more about supporting PC party donors, their friends, than they do survivors? Thank you. Attorney General to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I thank you for the question. It's, uh, this government is supporting victims across the province, and we support the families who are on the wrong end of crime, Mr. Speaker. We're giving them the support that they need in so many ways. And we recognize the important work the victim service organizations across the province are they're committed to supporting the individuals in need at a time of need and, and over a long period of time, Mr. Speaker. And it's critical that we support them, and we are supporting them. I had a fantastic meeting with, with several of the organizations and, and the the central organization for, for rape crisis centers last week, uh, very informative. We had a great conversation about how the system's working, how the system can work better, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, it's about sometimes coordinating better and making sure that we're understanding the needs of victims when they need the help. We're making sure that we are there for them. The previous Liberal government tried Spons. to politicize the issue of victims of crime, Mr. Speaker, and that was the wrong way to go. We want to make sure that we're going to fix the system, to make sure the system is working properly for those in time of need when they need. Thank you very much. Thank you. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, we don't coordinate survivors. We support and listen to survivors. Speaker, my question is back to the Premier. Historical child abuse survivors are not getting any support, by the way. If this government truly gave a darn, they'd, reduce their, they'd, re, they'd re, reverse their reckless cuts. Again, Liberal lip service and Conservative cuts aren't helping anyone, Mr. Speaker. Ontarians need a government that's finally on their side and fighting for what matters to them. Survivors in crisis centres need support, and they need it today, not tomorrow. Will the minister stop taking their cuts out on women and survivors and finally provide Ontario's rape crisis centres with the funding they deserve? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The Attorney General to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government is committed to supporting victims. The Ministry of the Attorney General has been undertaking a comprehensive review of services, providing services to victims of crime, their families and witnesses. Mr. Speaker, we take this issue seriously. These are some of the most vulnerable in our, in our province, Mr. Speaker. We need to be there. We need to be there in a meaningful way to deliver the services they need most when they need it the most. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes the time we have for question period this morning. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Education concerning the system d'éducation publique. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. I also want to welcome a former member to this legislature who served the riding of Algoma in the 30th, 31st, 32nd, 33rd, 34th, 35th, 36th Parliament, Bud Wildman. Welcome back to Queen's Park. We're glad to have you here. There being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.